Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to this Smart Restart update for the campus community. Uh, my name is Matt Merrill. I'm in the Chancellor's Office serving as the Chancellor's Chief of Staff, and I'll be helping to moderate today's event. We have a number of panelists from across campus uh, who've been working uh, diligently on preparations for the fall and want to provide general updates to the campus community today about how we're preparing. Um, there will be uh, a number of short presentations followed by a good chunk of time for Q&A, and we've been taking questions through the email address provided in advance of the event. Uh, without further ado, I'll start by introducing Chancellor Blank, who will provide introductory remarks. Thank you, Matt. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks to everybody for joining us this morning. Um, those of you who might have been on earlier calls, I'm not sure that you're going to hear a lot new here. Um, but um, I'm delighted with whoever um, wants to be here and wants to um, hear what we're doing and ask questions. So um, a lot of things are going to be different this fall. We are in a very unique world that none of us have ever seen before. Um, we're doing business differently on the research side. We're doing business differently in terms of the education. There's a lot of adaptation needed. There's a lot of change going on. And new guidance on this is coming out almost daily. And some of that guidance is necessarily very complex. So um, I know that there's a lot coming at you. Put these changes here at the university on top of the changes that many of you are experiencing in your family life um, with children or elderly parents or trying to figure out how you and your spouse both work at home. Um, there's just a lot of anxiety out there. And I understand that. And uh, that makes people sometimes respond to this change um, with more emotion. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, um, we're just throwing a lot at you. It's a hard time. And I want to acknowledge that. Um, we did want to create this opportunity as a chance for you to um, ask questions, um, to get answers to things that you might feel we haven't yet seen an answer to on all of the stuff that's going on on the Smart Restart um, website. As you know, Things are changing. We keep learning more about this virus, more about the most effective ways to deal with things um, as every week goes by. So we are adapting to that. And I will tell you things will, to a certain extent, continue to change. We don't know everything we want to know. We don't have all the answers to all the questions. But um, we're working as hard to stay up with what we know um, and what people are experiencing at other universities as possible. There's lots of information on the Smart Restart website. I hope you've looked at that. It's updated regularly. Um, you know, look through it to find the type of information that you need. And we're holding a number of these town hall meetings. Um, this is the run of show for today. I'm gonna to make some brief opening remarks. I'll be followed by the provost who's gonna talk about instruction and classroom issues. Um, he'll be followed by uh, Vice Chancellor Steve Ackerman who's gonna talk about research and research opening. Um, they'll be followed by Vice Chancellor Lauren Heller and Al Fish, head of our facilities and management, um, who are going to talk about administration, HR, and facilities issues. Um, Laurie Reeser, Vice Chancellor Laurie Reeser, will then talk about student life. And um, Jake Baggett, head of the University Health Service, is going to talk about public health efforts. And Norman Drinkwater, who's leading our testing, is going to talk about our testing plans. Everybody is supposed to be very brief because we want to leave as much time as possible for Q&A. So um, let me just say a little bit here before turning it over to the provost. We are um, tasked with carrying out our mission here at the university and um, we're doing it in the midst of an unprecedented crisis and going to be doing it in a very different way than in the past. Um, our commitment is to be as open as we can with you about this community as we navigate this challenge, what we're thinking, what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, how we're modifying um, operations and how we both need to work together and we need your help to make any of this happen. Um, we have had, however, to move very quickly over the summer as we have shut down in March and within a week um, and then over a very short period of time, tried to completely revamp how we do business here in order to reopen this campus in, the, in, in early September. In the past three months, we've developed plans that involve changes in virtually every aspect of our business. And as we've developed those plans, we have tried to communicate. I know there's a lot of information getting pushed out fast, and it's one reason we're trying to communicate through these town halls. Um, on the research front, 
It's imperative that we get our research operating and keep it operating. These are the careers of our faculty and staff. It's the uh, work that our graduate students have to do to finish their studies and to move on. And I'm very pleased that we have almost all of the labs that want to reopen are um, reopened at this point. And Steve Ackerman will talk more about that. Um, of course, they're operating differently than they were in the past. They're much more de-densified, staggered hours, um, not that many people coming in together at the same time. Um, and the same way, um, we think it's quite important that we have some on-campus teaching going on as well. There's quite a bit of research that looks at the interactions that happen on video conversations versus the interactions that happen face-to-face, -face, and they are different. The face-to-face -face ones are much more spontaneous. In some ways, they're much more intimate. It is deeply important for our students where there are small classes that we can safely hold to engage in that type of face-to-face -face discussion with faculty and with each other. Now, of necessity, some classes can't meet that way. In fact, the majority of classes, as the provost will tell you, are meeting virtually. Our larger classes are all virtual. But some types of learning are just better in a face-to-face -face, um, interaction. So we're trying to offer as many of the smaller classes as possible, albeit physically distanced, masked, all health protocols in place. Um, as you know as well, a lot of student life happens outside the classroom. A lot of it's just butting up against people who are different, being part of student organizations that interest you in things you've never thought about before, holding those late night conversations in the dorms. Now, student organization is gonna be different. There are not going to be big gatherings of students. There's not gonna be large events on campus this fall. Nonetheless, being on campus does mean there will be interactions among students in the dorms, in their residence, places of residence off campus and in classrooms. And um, it lets people meet people from different countries and from different cultures. Um, lets them have some of those intense late night discussions that are a very important part of exploring who you are and where you're going as you're in this phase of your life in college. Um, finally, I would note whether we have campus open or closed for students, we're gonna have the majority of our students here in Madison. Our graduate students live here um, and outside of the students in the dorms, which are most freshmen, the great majority of our other students are going to be here taking up their housing contracts and living off campus. Um, in that sense, um, there's a real advantage to having some campus activities going on. It gives students focus. It gives them um, some things to schedule around. Um, it means that we are going to be providing regular testing and contact tracing um, services to those students, which we wouldn't if we weren't open. And um, it means that um, there are, uh, you know, the, 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 the we're going to be messaging them daily about health protocols and about wearing those masks and about not gathering in large parties. And um, I think we're going to get a lot better behavior because we are partially open and because we are in regular contact with our students through that than if they were simply out there in the community otherwise. Here's what the fall is going to look like, all right? widely available COVID testing and targeted testing for some groups. Norman is gonna talk more about that in a little bit. Universal mask wearing in all indoor spaces and wherever physical distancing is not possible. Physical distancing in classrooms, in offices, in hallways, wherever possible. Measures to reduce campus density, staggered hours. Um, some people teleworking while others are in the offices, depending on what the tasks are that need to be performed. Um, special cleaning efforts um, to make sure that uh, you know, we are, we are keeping spaces as clean as possible. A strong marketing effort aimed at communicating health protocols to faculty, staff, and students. We will be going online after Thanksgiving. We're not gonna send anyone out, everyone out around the country and then bring them back. So our last two weeks of class will definitely be online. Um, though, you know, I suspect there'll be research labs and some other work that will remain open after that point in time. And we will be keeping a public dashboard of our COVID case information that we will be publishing daily for the community. Lots and lots of people have worked on this. It's a huge team to which I owe thanks to getting us to this point. And I do want to thank them and appreciate all of their work. Finally, let me just say that nothing is certain about this fall. We have a testing regime in place that allows us to monitor the rates of infection among different groups on campus. If infections appear to be growing in one group, we have the ability then to try to shut that down, um, to try to get that under control. Um, but you know, we are going to be living this day to day to see what works and what doesn't. As many of you are aware, over this past week, some of our peer schools have started and stopped. 
UNC is one of them. Um, uh, the uh, University of Notre Dame is one of them. We have some different protocols in place than those schools did. Neither Notre Dame nor UNC had any broad testing plans. Um, they were only testing asymptomatic individuals and we're doing something much broader than that. There are other ways in which our protocols differ, um, but we are going to be watching and watching carefully. That said, we have a strong set of protocols in place. We've done a lot of planning. We're going to be messaging on the importance of these to everybody on campus. Given the number of students already in Madison, we're going to run this hybrid model of in-person and virtual learning. And um, I hope that we're going to run it successfully. Let me uh, turn things over to Provost Carl Schultz at this point. Carl. Thank you very much, Chancellor. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this what is on a beautiful August morning. Uh, and thank you for all that you do on campus. Um, let me give another thanks, and that's to the many, many, many staff and faculty who've been working since the spring, first to have a successful summer term, and then to do the planning necessary to successfully execute the, the fall semester. The range of issues that the instructional continuity teams have grappled with are really mind boggling. There's no playbook for what we're going through right now and their uh, kind of tireless work over a very long period of time has uh, prepared us as well as I think we possibly can be prepared for the fall. So we remain a wonderful internationally recognized university. Uh, enrollments of uh, incoming students want to come here. Our, uh, we will match our enrollment targets or come very close to our enrollment targets for the fall. So we're going to have a robust freshman class and many in, in kind of historically uh, consistent number of sophomore, junior, seniors and other continuing students uh, are going to be on campus. And so our students and their families are very excited about uh, pursuing their education at Wisconsin. As the chancellor mentioned, uh, roughly 45% of our courses are going to have, be in-person or have a hybrid format. So slightly more than half will be fully remote. Now, if you do that by credit hours, of course, a greater share of our classes will be remote. Around a quarter of our students are going to have all, that is 100% remote schedules. That is, uh, they will have no in-person classes. We set a goal as we were planning the fall that any student who's on campus who wishes to have at least one in-person experience should be able to do so. Um, and that, that leads to us uh, fairly closely monitoring the composition of remote versus in-person classes. I think at the end of the day, we're going to fall a little bit short of that aspiration, but I know our instructors, our TAs, our departments, our schools and colleges are doing all they can to provide as good an experience as possible for the students that we're serving. Now, as I work on instructional continuity and other issues around campus, I frequently get asked a set of questions, and I want to briefly highlight three of them that I'm most commonly asked. The first one is simply, what are classrooms going to look like and what steps are you taking to mitigate risks in those classrooms? Well, first, all of the seating in the classrooms for our students are going to be at least six feet apart. Our, our colleagues in FPNM have gone into the classrooms where there's removable seats and taken seats out so the remaining seats are at least six feet apart. When there's fixed seating, uh, chairs, seats have been marked you know, do not sit here. So students are easily able to separate themselves and instructors will be at least 10 to 12 feet away from the closest student. We've also, with our colleagues in FPNM, have sharply revised cleaning protocols. So there's gonna be more cleaning done of surfaces and other aspects. And then the HVAC uh, will be tuned when possible to increase airflow into the classrooms. There's also cleaning supplies going to be provided, whether wipes and other supplies uh, for faculty, instructors, and students to wipe down surfaces and hand sanitize their stations. There's over 500 of them installed throughout campus, including outside many of the classrooms. As the chancellor mentioned, face coverings are going to be required. And for a student who had 
or anyone else who happens to forget their face covering, those will be provided. And lastly, our colleagues in the College of Engineering have been extremely innovative about designing face shields that are, have, are ordered and will be distributed throughout uh, through departments and schools and colleges, and also devices to fit masks even more closely. And so a disposable mask can have the same, almost the same properties as an N95 mask. But a next question that I often get is, well, what if students refuse to wear a mask? All right, the simple answer to that is they're not, they may not attend the class. But of course, what happens if a student is in class, kind of has a mask on, and then that mask isn't being worn properly or they decide to take it off? Well, first, they should be asked by the instructor to leave the class. If, they're, if they don't comply with this, they should be referred to the Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards, and a process will quickly happen where students will be at, asked to not return to the class until they comply. And then lastly, an instructor, whether TA or academic staff or faculty instructor, is authorized to suspend or cancel a class immediately if there truly is a confrontation about mask wearing, and that student then will not be permitted into the class until that situation is resolved. All right, well, what the third question and last question before I turn this over is, what happens if a student or instructor gets ill? Well, first, the, the, the privacy concerns are complicated given HIPAA and other regulations. But one of the misconceptions that I stumble on a lot is that the entire class does not need to be quarantined. As the chancellor mentioned, that we are requiring students to have masks, we're ensuring that there's physical distancing in the classrooms. As such, classrooms are not considered close contact for the purposes of contact tracing, whether you look at guidance from the CDC, the Public Health Dane County, or our uh, experts from the School of Medicine and Public Health. They're clear that transmission occurs from long duration exposure to the virus from cl closer than six feet. And so our masking and distancing ensures that an entire classroom does not need to be quarantined. Well, what happens if an instructor tests positive? Well, we'll handle that in a manner similar to other situations involving instructor illness. Departments will be asked to find coverage of colleagues or other qualified instructors. TAs will be notified of these changes through normal departmental procedures. Well, what happens if a student tests positive or must be quarantined because of close contact with another person who tests positive? We obviously want to facilitate academic progress and success. So we're asking instructors to share plans with students uh, so that they can continue to make progress uh, uh, with their studies, just as we would do for a student who gets mononucleosis or flu in the, in the previous years. Details of these instructions and flexibilities, as well as students' individual situation, will of course vary from course to course, but we have some guidance in our uh, suggested syllabus language about what to expect, and we're asking departments and instructors and schools and colleges to do everything they can to support students' progress. We'll also, of course, ask students to reach out to their instructors as soon as possible if they become ill in quarantine and are unable to continue their coursework as planned in order to make alternative plans for how to proceed with their course. And I refer everyone to the instructional continuity page of the Smart Restart website that has a wealth of additional information. So I'd now like to turn things over to my colleague, Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education, Professor of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science, and one of only two trademark weather guys in the city of Madison, Steve Ackerman. Thank you, Provost, uh, for that introduction. Uh, and good morning, everyone, and thanks for participating. And thanks to those who have also submitted questions. These are interesting times. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic is wrecking havoc uh, around the world and is forcing public institutions and us as individuals to rethink our everyday behaviors and practices as we seek to minimize the spread of the virus. Back in March, our initial response to COVID-19 was to move most research off campus. Under those guidelines, only essential research activities on campus 
were approved. And by essential, I mean research with cell lines, therapeutics, or dealt directly uh, with COVID-19. We know that all research uh, cannot be accomplished uh, remotely. Some has to take place in the field. Some requires wet labs. Others require in equipment and instrumentation, <clears throat> excuse me, that is only available on campus. So to support that research, we rebooted campus uh, research in early June, allowing people to come back who could not do their work remotely. Only a limited expansion of research activities was approved then, and we took a conservative approach to setting health protocols and guidelines with the goal of learning how to operate safely in this new environment. Since then, we have gradually expanded research activities while ensuring that we continue to follow guidelines and minimize the impacts of the spread of COVID-19. Recognizing that some research requires face-to-face -face activities, we added that capability in July. Also in July, we allowed undergraduate students to return to campus to support research activities. That expansion of research on campus continues and has been successful. And I thank all of you who have participated in that effective endeavor. We were able to increase research on campus and to do so while minimizing the risk of disease transmission. This required planning and that reduced the risk of transmission of COVID-19. We did this in collaboration with the schools and colleges and followed guidelines set forth by federal and state health protocols. Like the spring and summer research reboot, preparation for the fall semester includes significant planning on how to do that while minimizing risk. We have learned a lot about COVID-19 uh, and the transmission of the virus since March, and I see no need to return to those March guidelines of moving most research off campus. I acknowledge the rapidly shifting challenge that COVID-19 presents, along with the uncertainty many of you and me are currently feeling about how best to pursue our research and career goals and opportunities. I encourage you to persist in working towards those goals. So thank you. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, Lauren Heller, who serves as UW-Madison's Chief Financial Officer and oversees a wide range of departments and units. Lauren? Cool. Uh, thank you, Steve. I uh, appreciate the introduction and uh, very much appreciate having all of you join us here today on a Friday. Uh, like me, perhaps you're a little tired. Uh, it's been a long week. Uh, been a long summer, right? Uh, and, um, you know, I know you've been working really hard. Uh, me and all my colleagues here on the call today really appreciate everything you've been doing. Uh, many thousands of our university staff, academic staff, faculty, and students and student employees uh, have been on campus working uh, around the clock uh, ever since this whole thing started in March uh, to keep vital elements of our mission going, uh, whether that was keeping students in the dorms uh, that didn't have another place to go, uh, getting meals served, um, keeping important research going, keeping our health enterprise going. Uh, you know, um, uh, Madison is a huge and varied place, uh, and it's the people that make it go. Uh, thanks for all you're doing for us uh, on all of that. Um, of course, uh, we're trying to stay plugged into that and what's going on, uh, learn what's working, learn what's not working, and what we can do better uh, as we go through this challenging time. Uh, one piece of our efforts there was a uh, all-employee survey. Uh, we just got the results from that survey back uh, earlier this week. Um, so more than 7,000 responses to the survey. Uh, you know, one of the key things we were trying to figure out is do people know where to get help and where to get answers to their questions? 87% uh, uh, said that yes, they had reviewed the Smart Restart website uh, that we mentioned tirelessly uh, over and over again. And uh, I was happy to see 81% uh, said the resources were helpful. Uh, so that means we haven't hit all the boxes yet. Uh, there's still some gaps. Uh, you know, some of the key themes we heard on that survey uh, were a need for clear public health protocols. I'm going to talk about that a teeny bit. Uh, Jake will talk about it more. Uh, ensuring our coworkers actually follow those protocols. Uh, providing flexibility to employees who need it, uh, either because of health reasons or other concerns like childcare uh, and the like during the pandemic. 
um, and providing clear communications from leaders. Uh, so obviously we're here today trying to do that. Um, let me hit that health protocols point really quick. Uh, you know, our success this fall, uh, our health as a community, uh, the success of our mission really relies on us all doing our part and following these health and safety protocols. Uh, that means you're wearing a mask when you're on campus, uh, when you're in a building, unless you're in your office with the door closed. Uh, otherwise, you've got your mask on. Uh, you can't forget it. Uh, you know, we will have masks. There will be disposable masks available. Uh, indeed, we've made PPE freely available to all campus units. There's a form on the website. Uh, where you can get PPE, face shields, gloves, masks, uh, whatever you think would help you. Uh, and um, those are provided free of charge. Uh, you know, it's also worth noting to that point, we need to ensure our coworkers are actually following the protocols. You need to follow the protocols for yourself, uh, but you need to follow the protocols for your coworkers. Uh, you have a duty and a responsibility to the broader community. Uh, and, you know, we do as an employer. Uh, so we're going to hold people accountable for doing this. Uh, you know, if people are not following the protocols, discipline will be enforced uh, using all the tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, we know there are exceptional circumstances. Some people have health reasons they can't wear a mask. That's a different story. Uh, and of course, we'll be accommodating there. Uh, but we take this very seriously uh, on the staff side as well as on the student side. Uh, one other quick point uh, here before I hand it off. Uh, about flexibility. Um, we have been going out of our way to do everything we can uh, to be flexible for our employees in this time because we know you need it uh, and we need you. Uh, so we're doing everything we can there. It really has to be a kind of individual approach, generally speaking, to that. Uh, so talk to your supervisor. Uh, see what you can work out. Um, see how we can get you what you need uh, while still getting the work done. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable doing that, you can always talk to human resources uh, in your area, or you could talk uh, to the divisional disability representatives, if even that feels a little uncomfortable to you. Uh, these are folks who are specially trained um, to handle uh, confidential matters, and they work with us on like our ADA accommodations process, for example. And these folks are experts at negotiating and figuring out a way to get everyone's needs met. Uh, you can find a list of who your divisional disability representative is or DDR is uh, on the Smart Restart website or just by Googling it, uh, UW-Madison DDR. Uh, okay, so I'll cut it off there and uh, hand it off to my uh, dear colleague, uh, Al Fish uh, from FPNM. Thanks, Lauren, and uh, good morning, everyone. Clearly, battling this uh, pandemic the biggest issue we have in our approach is to do a layered safety approach. So I'm gonna talk about the layers that we're working on here at facilities planning and management. Carl talked a lot about what we're trying to do in classrooms with de-densifying them and adding cleaning supplies so that they are cleaned every time and people are spread out. And that really is the general approach that we're taking for uh, the entire campus is we want people to have their mask on, we want them to keep moving and reduce density, and that will all help us uh, reduce the amount of infection that can be spread. So we're going to be doing cleaning a little differently on campus this year. Uh, we're going to go ahead and figure out exactly uh, what kind of trash and recycling that we used to pick up out of the office is now you're going to be picking them up and taking them out to a location on your floor. So that will help us redeploy our custodial staff to clean the high touch areas and common spaces throughout the buildings. So that will be one different thing. The other thing Carl mentioned that we're doing a lot of work on indoor air quality. And what that means is we're bringing in more outside air and we're running our systems longer to get more air changes. The de-densification uh, is important everywhere on campus. So whether it's your break room, uh, your office setup, uh, any of the common spaces that are there, and of course, the classrooms as well. We're just trying to spread people out and provide that margin of safety. The last thing I want to talk about is really how to get to and from campus. So transportation has been a big question for many people. And obviously, a lot of people, especially students, are living close. They're biking. They're walking. But we have a lot of people that come back and forth with buses. So metro buses service and our campus uh, cir circulation all starts next Monday, uh, and that will be full service. But the buses themselves are lower density. And so what that means is there'll only be 20 or 25 people on a bus. 
So we've ordered more buses that we can respond to the demand that we'll have and keep the density down on the buses themselves. There are going to be a lot fewer people on campus. The very large classes that used to let out and create lots of congestion around both inside buildings and outside buildings are now online. So we're going to be evaluating what that campus flow looks like and how we might need to react to it as we move forward. For those of you who are not taking buses, we have a lot of flexibility in parking this year. We have a big park and ride program that is an option for you. We've encouraged many people to sign up for flex parking. So if you're only coming to campus two or three days a week, that would be a great option for you to both save money and save more parking capacity. Many people are still getting their base lot um, and we'll keep adjusting for what your needs are throughout the year. For example, if you started out with a base lot and you find out that you really can use flex parking, every two weeks you'll have an opening where you can transfer and make a request to go from a base lot into flex parking or vice versa. We've also got a $40 pass for people to buy that they can get into any of our garages for five days uh, as well. So those flexible assignments throughout the year and the multiple choices that you have hopefully will help you get back and forth. And of course, we've always continued our accessible transportation that you can get at by calling transportation or the DDRs that uh, Lauren mentioned. The final thing I'll point out is that uh, how this campus operates this year, we are guessing and making projections of how that will work, but we're gonna be watching very closely and being prepared to respond and be flexible and nimble as we see problems or as we see things that we need to respond to. So please let us know if you see issues and we'll be able to work together to try and resolve them. So now I'm gonna pass it on to Lori Reeser and Student Affairs. Good morning, everyone. I also want to add my appreciation and thanks to everything that everybody on this campus is doing and especially in, with the goal of supporting our students and helping them be successful this fall. We know this is a really stressful and anxious time for everyone. I want to acknowledge that our students of color, as well as our faculty and staff of color, have experienced additional trauma this summer in the light of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the constant acts of racial injustice in our country that they experience every day. As a campus community, we need to address these issues and especially we need to support our underrepresented students. So I would like to take a few minutes to talk about some of the things that we're doing as it relates to COVID and how we're supporting our students. So we're asking all students to do an educational video about COVID-19. So they're aware of the risks, they're aware of the educational um, information that they need to know. And at the end of this video, they'll sign a Badger pledge, which indicates their commitment to following the appropriate safety behaviors and guidelines. We've done a lot of information um, we've sent a lot of information to students. We've done a number of um, presentations to parents and students. There's been a lot of emails and communication. We had a town hall this week for graduate students. We are planning a town hall next week, more focused for undergraduate students so that we can be really clear and transparent about our expectations and the accountability that will come with that as well. A few other pieces of support, again, as we know that um, this is a really stressful time. We saw that in the spring when we went to virtual learning, and we we're so grateful for the um, extra emphasis that our faculty and staff had um, worrying about students. There is a link on the Dean of Students Office website that um, allows people to talk about a student of concern. So if you're worried about a student or they're not behaving okay or they're not showing up in class or you're just worried about their mental health, we really encourage you to fill out that form and then we will follow up with that student. Again, we're worried about isolation and how our students are feeling and we're trying to um, provide even additional support and outreach to our students. We have set up events for campus, um, campus events, but also for all of our student organizations. And all of these event guidelines require that our students and our student organizations follow the most recent Dane County and Madison public health guidelines, obviously including masks, social distancing, the number of participants that can um, be engaged in those spaces. And what we're trying to do then is also provide safe opportunities for our students to have social opportunities. So you'll see more tents on campus and we're gonna allow students to um, reserve those tents so they can have their 
student organization meetings. We know it's better and safer for our students to be outside than it is inside. And so we're going to try to provide some additional opportunities for students so they can socialize and still engage in some of their opportunities in very safe ways. I want to make sure you know UHS has a 24-hour um, nurse advice line, and we always have our mental health crisis line for after hours. And we will continue to be providing all of those services for our students, um, primarily virtually, but we also know at times the best way to handle some of these more urgent situations will be in person. Our unions are only going to be open to students, faculty, and staff, and you will have to show your ID in order to go into the union. Again, this is a way to control density. This is a way to make sure that people are being very, very safe. And we're going to try to be intentional to provide study spaces throughout campus so that students have access to those spaces in a safe way. Finally, I just want to talk about enforcement. I know this is a high concern. We've seen these issues nationally. This is kind of one of the benefits that we have about opening later that we're learning from other institutions across the country. We are absolutely going to have strict enforcement of our public health guidelines on and off campus. Every single person has talked about this. There is an incident report online specifically related to COVID that anybody can fill out if they are worried or seeing anybody, but this is really for students that are not following those guidelines. This is for behavior both on campus as well as off campus. Um, Carl, the provost talked about um, students in the classroom. If they're not following these guidelines, then students will not be allowed to be in, in class, plain and simple. But I know people are worried about behavior off campus as well. And we are we sent one email to students this week. We will be sending another email to students next week that will be talking about and reinforcing the strict guidelines that we have. We are also partnering very, very closely with our city officials to make sure that good communication is happening. So if a, if a student is found in violation of the city public health guidelines and they receive, they could re be fined by the city for not following guidelines. We will know that information so we can take appropriate action as a university as well. Our code of conduct allows us to both manage on campus and off campus behavior. So we are increasing our collaboration with our city colleagues to make sure that both sides are aware of situations that are happening. I also want to acknowledge that our fraternities and sororities have done amazing work and they themselves have decided there will be no social events with alcohol or social events um, this fall at all. And again, that's their commitment to providing a safe experience. At the same time, those spaces are similar to our residence halls. They have a lot, number of students that are living together. So what may look like a social event is really the, the members of that living unit who are outside playing football or engaging in different behavior. So we're working really, really closely with the fraternities and sororities and really all of our off-campus students to make sure they understand the seriousness of this, make sure they understand the consequences that that could happen and our enforcement will be held and will be very, very strong. So look, with that, let me turn it over to um, Jake Baggett who will talk about our public health guidelines. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Reeser. Um, again, thank you for taking time to join us today to uh, learn more about the work that we're doing. Um, so there's been a tremendous amount of work and you're gonna, you're gonna continue to get additional information as it becomes available. One of the things that we're very fortunate to have is, is, is being located in a community and in a county that has taken this, this uh, pandemic quite seriously, and that's reflected in our uh, health policies here uh, locally and, and in the ones that are, are on campus. And as a result of that, uh, things like face coverings and physical distancing and limiting sizes of groups and so forth, as a result of those kinds of strategies, the prevalence rate here in Dane County has remained uh, relatively low and certainly considerably less than what it is in other parts of the state and, and country. Um, right now, as uh, the, the seven day average uh, positivity test is about 1.7%, um, and the, the number of tests, the positive tests that happened continued to, to, to decline on, the day, on a daily basis. Um, you may be aware, uh, and hopefully are aware, that we have uh, already opened up on-campus testing. 
We know that access to testing is critical so that any individual, whether you're a faculty or staff or student, that you can, um, if you have the need or feel the need to be tested, you can go easily get tested and get those results back in, in, a, in a quick turnaround time. So on August 6th, we open up the Henry Mall location, uh, which is now both a walk-up as a and a drive-through location, and individuals are taking advantage of that. And our early testing results uh, uh, are actually lining up very much with what we're, the prevalence we're seeing in the community. So we're encouraged by that. Um, the uh, you, In order to make a test, we'd ask that you go to your MyUHS uh, portal, um, and you can pre-register and sign electronic consent uh, in advance of going there. And then if you show up uh, during the time that you're scheduled to be there, you will spend just minutes it, at that site and be able to move about your way. Because the testing is being collected on campus and, and, and processed locally, we are getting the results back within 24 to 36 hours in, in most cases. And because of that, we will be able to notify the individuals about those test results very quickly through a secure message or a direct uh, phone call. Um, so if you get any contacts from UHS, it's important that you respond to those quickly. The second testing site um, was scheduled to open uh, sometime next week at the Fluno location. And then we have a third testing site if the demand is, is needed to, uh, to also expand that capacity. So we feel very confident in our ability to, um, to, to provide ready access to testing. There's no cost for that, and there's no limit on the, on the test that, that you can take advantage of. We wanna be sure that if you need a test, that you get a test. Also, what's really important with that is the um, contact tracing work that, that, that is necessary to go on. So UHS and the campus have been working with the public health department here in Madison-Dane County um, to uh, coordinate and support the public health uh, uh, contact tracing mission. And so we have actually trained staff in collaboration with them and continue to, to add additional staff every week. And we literally have dozens of staff that their, their focus is now to support that public health, that contact tracing uh, mission. So that if we do identify a positive case, that we have folks that can quickly identify who may have been considered a close contact and support them and, and get everybody in the, in the right situation so that they can successfully navigate that, that experience. In addition to that, we also have um, well-developed isolation and quarantine protocols. Um, the campus is, is, is uh, identified a substantial number of, of spaces that if we need to, we can, we can relocate students who reside on campus to a, a quarantine or an isolation space to support them uh, during that period of time. Um, so a lot of information, of course, is available online. If, if one of our students uh, is identified uh, that way, they will be, you know, quickly uh, relocated to one of these facilities, and then there will be regular oversight and support for them during that period of time, whether it's food or support services or uh, medical oversight uh, during that period of time. So we we feel again well prepared to to respond to the to that demand uh, should it occur. We also um, have strong. Um, uh, protocols around notifying uh, the appropriate parties on campus about um, uh, positive test results. You know, as a, as a faculty member, um, if there's a student in your class that tests positive, you will receive a notification that somebody tested positive. You won't necessarily be receive information about that person's identity because of confidentiality, but that student will also be directly contacted and, and encouraged to reach out to their faculty and their advisors to let them know what's going on and provided documentation to support their need to be away from the, uh, from the classroom for a period of time. Um, and and uh, the, if you're an employee, um, uh, your uh, divisional disability representative in your unit will also receive notification so that they can support you as needed as well. And then the environmental health and safety uh, team here with Alan Fish's shop are also, um, you know, will be notified and take any necessary measures there where maintenance is, uh, or cleaning is, is indicated. We also have a self-reporting uh, expectation that's established for, for employees and staff. So if you get tested someplace off campus um, uh, and you get those test results, we'd ask that you share that with us so we can support you um, and that contact tracing and public health mission uh, as well. Um, if you get tested on campus, you don't need to self-report. We'll already receive that information and likely we'll have shared it with you ourselves. 
Um, so there's a there's a number of other protocols around around uh, supporting students and faculty and staff success during this period of time, and we just encourage you to take a look at those. Um, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Norman Drinkwater, the special assistant to the Chancellor for COVID-19 testing, and Professor of Oncology Emeritus, who will talk about more specifics about our testing strategy. Thanks, Jake. I wanted to very briefly discuss the testing strategy that we've developed over the last two and a half months uh, to help keep the campus safe. So this testing strategy really has three parts, and uh, Dr. Beg had already discussed one of the parts, the on-campus testing sites that allow any member of the campus community to receive a test for COVID-19 uh, whenever they feel they need it. Um, <clears throat> that uh, Those testing sites are already open and I would certainly encourage anyone who desires a COVID-19 test to visit one of them. As uh, Jake mentioned, those uh, visits can be very brief uh, to provide a sample and you will get the results within a day or so. Uh, the second part of our campus testing program really focuses on the residents of the dormitory. So all of the incoming uh, dorm residents will be tested on the, at the time that they move in. And all those uh, dorm residents, as well as the staff who serve them, will be tested on a regular basis throughout the semester. The third piece of our three-part program is really focused on the issue of what is the true prevalence of COVID-19 infection on campus. We don't know that uh, number. We only know the number of people who test positive who go into, for example, one of the community test sites. Uh, so to do that, uh, to estimate that prevalence, we've developed uh, a surveillance program that really has two pieces. One piece is focused on faculty, staff, and graduate assistants, and that's a longitudinal study where uh, up to a cohort of up to a thousand uh, individuals will be tested on a weekly basis uh, to determine whether or not they've been infected uh, by SARS-CoV-2. In addition to that, each, each week we'll be identifying 300 to 500 undergraduates who live off campus chosen at random and invite them to come to the one, one of the on-campus testing sites uh, to receive a test. And they'll be provided with an incentive to do that uh, on completion of the test. Now, this surveillance program will allow us to estimate the prevalence of uh, COVID-19 infection uh, to a, a high level of accuracy such that we'll be able to use that information for planning purposes in terms of how best to respond to any uh, pockets of infection on campus. So with that level of testing, it really became essential that we develop an on-campus testing lab. As you will imagine, uh, human diagnostic testing is a highly regulated uh, business, uh, regulated at both the state and the federal level. So we've been fortunate to have a partnership between the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene, which is a well-recognized clinical diagnostic laboratory, and the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, which has a large amount of experience doing very complex tests in the veterinary sphere, to develop a brand new testing lab that will allow us to have the capacity to do the COVID-19 tests that we need. <clears throat> that, as you, as you will imagine, setting up such a lab from scratch is a very complicated endeavor, but we're confident that they will be able to serve the level of campus testing needs that we uh, require early in September. In the meantime, we have contracts with the local vendor exact sciences to provide testing support uh, as needed until we are able to take on that burden ourselves. So. Uh, the, the area of uh, COVID-19 testing is a very active research area with new uh, opportunities arising all the time. And we continuously evaluate those new approaches to testing uh, in, a, in a longer term effort to ensure that we can increase the capacity for testing on campus so that we can provide the level of testing that we need to achieve success in, uh, in moving forward the campus mission. So that's all I had uh, for this. And I guess I'll turn this back to Matt. Thanks very much, Norman. Um, uh, so now we're gonna transition into the question and answer uh, period of our time together today. Uh, we have over 1300 people, I think, who are logged in and a wide variety of questions. So I'm not gonna waste any time and let me go and start by asking perhaps what has been the most frequent question that we've gotten over the past month or so. Uh, and I'll direct this one to the chancellor. Uh, why are we comfortable at this moment bringing students back to campus when uh, in March we had to send everyone home for safety reasons? So in March, we had no idea what we were facing. 
We knew almost nothing about this disease. We didn't know well its transmission mechanism. We didn't know what the prevention strategies were that worked and that didn't work. We didn't know if you had to wipe off your groceries or not. Um, there's been an enormous amount of science and there's still things that we are learning, obviously on a weekly and monthly basis. Um, by the middle of the summer, it became quite clear that at least as the science currently exists, um, you know, if you are masked, if you're six feet apart, there's very little evidence of transmission. That gave us a pathway to say, all right, can we do that on campus and, and how do we do it? Um, we know a lot about sort of what type of cleaning you have to do, what type of cleaning solutions you have to use. Um, you know, so the knowledge that we've gained, I think, has gotten us quite a ways down the road that makes it much more um, possible to um, move towards this opening. And indeed, you know, we've been opening labs all over the summer. Um, so far, it's not that there aren't people on our campus community who have become ill, but of those who've become ill, we at least at present have no evidence that any of those transmissions occurred because of activities on campus. Thanks, Chancellor. Um, perhaps a, another one for you. Obviously, those of us, have, uh, everyone has been following the news closely, watching uh, some of the challenges that uh, other schools have had as they've reopened. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, what we're learning and what lessons we're taking from the experiences of some of those peer schools like uh, UNC and Notre Dame? So I don't know all of the protocols that those schools were following, but um, we do have quite a bit of information on some of their testing protocols. Both UNC and Notre Dame essentially didn't have very much testing at all. They were not doing surveillance testing. They didn't have testing sites available on campus for anyone to stop by. They weren't even testing in the dorms. Um, so um, they had an explosion without, you know, without having the information that you need if you're going to try to control it. Um, and I, that gives me some hope that with a different and more expansive testing regime, we're going to be able to do some things that they weren't able to do. The other thing is, that, at least at UNC, is they hadn't set aside any isolation or quarantine facilities for their dorm residents. Um, and they suddenly had you know, more people who needed them than they had available. We have been quite explicit. In fact, in the middle of the summer, we doubled the amount of space available. Um, we're using our conference facilities right now, which um, if we need them, they're there and they're not being used elsewhere for other things. Um, and we've actually um, signed some contracts with a couple of um, hotels in the area so that we have up to a thousand spaces for isolation and quarantine for close contacts. Um, if there is an outbreak in the dorms and we need to move some people um, into quarantine for a period of time. Great, thank you. Um, maybe a question here both to, for you, Chancellor, and uh, also for the provost. If we did hit a point at which uh, uh, campus needed to modify its operations, would it be a full semester shutdown or would you consider uh, the possibility of a two week virtual quarantine period uh, like we've seen some other schools? Uh, so, you know, some of this does depend upon the data that's coming in and what we're observing. You know, if we observe a cluster of infections in a lab in the veterinary school, um, we're going to focus on the veterinary school and those labs and their operations and not affect other pieces on campus. Um, if we have a more widespread um, a problem with regard to students, um, we will focus on students and instruction. And as Steve mentioned, um, we hope that we don't have to pull the labs down in that case. Um, you know, whether we would consider a two week shutdown or simply go all to online classes, I think that depends a lot on where you are in the semester and what, what it's looking like. It's gonna be very hard for our faculty to be told in a very short period of time, now go online, but two weeks later, we might come back in person again. That's just hard to deal with if you're trying to teach a coherent and consistent class. So, you know, my guess is if we do come to a point where we have to change what we're doing, we're likely to simply transition to um, online learning for the rest of the semester. But this is both a quantitative and a qualitative decision, and it is going to depend on what we're seeing and where we're seeing it. I, I'll add just very, very briefly, I was on a call yesterday with provosts from around the country, and they expressed a fair bit of skepticism about the efficacy of two week uh, break. Since students are still on campus, they're still in their living arrangements, and there's even less structure going on. But one of the advantages of being a little bit behind other institutions in the academic calendar is we can learn from them. We can learn from Notre Dame and how successful their two week break is. We can learn from the University of Maryland and see how that has gone for them. But the other important point that the chancellor's mentioned, but I want to reinforce, unlike March, 
our, our, our decisions to scale back doesn't have to be that zero one. We can scale back selectively in different parts of campus. So it's very important, for instance, for our students to do a clinical education to be able to pursue that education to make timely progress to degree. So unless it's absolutely essential to shut down that aspect of the educational enterprise, we likely won't. Uh, similarly, as the Chancellor and Steve Ackerman have mentioned, we have very successfully reintroduced a lot of research on the campus. It doesn't seem necessary, depending on the patterns that we see, to necessarily shut down all of that activity that we've been successfully doing all summer. And so we will be, uh, how do I want to say, it, more flexible uh, uh, in, how, in how we uh, proceed in the fall if a change of course is needed. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Chancellor. Uh, maybe one final one for the Chancellor before we uh, go on to other panelists. Uh, a question here. Um, many of many people are wondering how presidents and chancellors made the decision to pull down athletics, but yet, uh, sorry, postpone fall sports competitions, but yet um, still return and bring students back to campus. Can you describe what we see differently and kind of the, uh, the, the risks associated with with fall competition and athletics versus the instructional space? Yeah, no, it's a great question, one that I've gotten a lot of in the last two weeks. Um, you know, there are three things that are different about um, athletic competition um, that aren't the same in the normal student population. Um, the first one is um, when you're engaged in team sports and particularly contact sports, it is not possible to socially distance. And in many cases, given the level at which these games are being played to, to wear masks, um, that makes athletic competition definably different from the rest of campus, where we are enforcing masking and social distancing. So that was concern number one. And of course, that then relates to contact tracing and all the other health protocols. Um, concern number two is that when you're in athletics, you have to play a schedule of games, right? And, um, you know, if one or two people on your um, senior line get ill, um, you know, you may, and, and they live with a couple of other people, you may have to pull down your game for the coming weekend because you just can't field the team that you want to field. Um, or if the, the group you're playing has that problem, and we know those clusters will pop up, that very quickly disrupts the schedule. And um, all it takes is one or two teams that are then out for two weeks and the whole schedule falls apart. So the scheduling issues really began to look very challenging when we matched them against the data that we were seeing in terms of some clusters of affections occurring here and there. Um, the third problem was just a huge lack of information yet on some of the long-term effects of coronavirus, particularly around those who engage in extreme exercise, which is, most of our student athletes. And there have been some questions around heart infections and some other things that seem to be related to coronavirus and, um, and extensive exercise. And in the absence of having very good information on that and those sorts of health questions, it just seems smart to pull down competition. Now, our athletes are still doing training they're still doing some, you know, limited team meetings. They're in pods and, you know, meeting all the Dane County guidelines in terms of how many people gather and, and you know, they're masked and distanced. Um, but um, we just didn't think we could play a competitive season. And I think it's the right decision. I voted for it. Um, you know, I would love to believe that we're going to be able to come back in the spring because either we've got more um, control over the virus or we've got testing regimes or we gathered more health information that makes us more confident about this. Um, but for right now, for this fall, um, it did not make sense to play. And I think the fact that a number of schools are even pulling down their, um, their all of their um, studies and presence of students on campus supports that decision. Uh, thanks, Chancellor. Um, so maybe in, uh, this next one, I'll, I'll direct to Jake. Um, so obviously in this unprecedented situation, everyone's looking for information. What plans do we have to offer a dashboard of daily uh, or weekly COVID testing information to the campus community? Thanks, Matt. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, the, the leadership and, and the experts here on campus and our community have been pouring through data all spring and summer long uh, to try to help formulate and inform our plans uh, as well. We also think it's vital that the campus understands what we're experiencing so that they can see that that we do have a robust testing uh, 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 program in place and that individuals are taking advantage of that. We also want uh, to make sure that the community understands what those results are showing us um, uh, so that you know they have an idea and can see the impact of their own 
um, uh, activities as well. Hopefully that, that will be influential, both in terms of supporting the protocols that we have in place, as well as um, uh, informing individuals. We think that the more everybody, that the better everybody understands how this is working, the, 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 the more effective we will be as an institution and successful. So early, sometime early next, or to, sometime next week, we should have some da level dashboard uh, standing up. Thanks, Jake. Um, let me ask a question for uh, Carl here. Um, are the, is the university planning on making its facilities available to students who want to seek a place to study or meet with peers? Uh, I gather this one came from a, from a student who's returning to campus because they're uh, expressing some concern about having to be 24 seven in dorms or in off campus bedrooms uh, and expressing a desire for some place to meet and pursue their studies outside of a single bedroom. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. And as, as we set up for the fall, we want to do everything we can to support our students and ensure student success. And so um, there's a few things that have been happening. So throughout the summer, our library system has gradually been opening the libraries. First, it was just curbside uh, service. So if you needed a book or materials out of the library, you could contact them and then someone would drop it off and you'd drive by and it hand it off. And then the spaces in the libraries have been open and the, opening and they've been doing that successfully. Uh, and so libraries are con continuing to do that, both uh, Memorial Library and Helen C will have spaces, but there's this kind of fundamental tension, if you will, that we're very much working to de-densify campus. And so as you heard everyone talk about, uh, libraries will gradually be opening and making themselves accessible, but still following the Dane County guidelines. That is masking, six feet of distance. And so that's one spot. And then uh, really one of the uh, really successful as aspects of the Smart Restart process has been uh, with colleagues in the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs Office and the Instructional Continuity Team have been, have been identifying spaces across campus. And now we have over a thousand spaces that some available by drop-in, some available by scheduling, where students can go to, to study, to take exams, to actually uh, engage in their re remote courses, if courses are remote. And we will be monitoring that closely to get an idea, is 1,000 or 1,200 sufficient to meet demand, or do we need more? Because the question that got asked identifies a really critical part of what we have to do to have a successful fall. And that is to provide spaces where students can comfortably learn and participate in the affairs on campus. Uh, the last thing before being quiet for now is even between classes. So students may have a mix of in-person and remote classes. And so imagine a situation where a student has an in-person class at 10 o'clock and then again at two o'clock, doesn't want to go home or uh, between them. Is there a space that they can uh, study on campus? And so we're working hard to find those spaces. All right, thank you. Um, let me turn to Norman with maybe a couple more specific testing questions that have come in. Uh, Norman, can you speak kind of specifically, what are the types of tests that we're running and um, what's the sensitivity uh, of those tests? So the core or uh, testing program is to use an RT-PCR test that's really the gold standard for uh, testing for viral genetic material in human samples. Those uh, samples will be uh, lower nasal swab samples, uh, which has been found to be every bit as uh, effective as the much more intrusive nasopharyngeal swabs that have been uh, widely used in the past. Um, the sensitivity uh, for the test that we're using exceeds 95%. Uh, specificity is in the realm of 99%. And so that limits the number of both false negatives and false positives that we would see with that test. Thanks. Um, let me uh, uh, let me ask a, another follow-up question. Obviously, lots of people have seen the news from over the past month about long turnaround times on testing across the country. What steps have we uh, as a university taken to make sure that we don't see that amongst the tests performed for our campus community? 
Right. So uh, we have set up a, a lab that has sufficient scale that we will be able to return results ideally within 24 hours of the uh, uh, of the test. The current tests, uh, which are being done by an off-campus uh, vendor, uh, usually return results within 24 to 36 hours. So we will watch that very carefully and we will make sure that we have the resources available to get testing back uh, as quickly as possible so that actions, appropriate actions can be taken. Great, thanks. And let me go on a one final testing question. This one probably more for Jake than, than Norman. If a student's awaiting a test result, what should they do? What type of behavior should they, they take and what guidance are we providing? So uh, first of all, we should all be, um, you know, using caution about how we uh, interact with each other, maintaining that physical distance uh, expectation and face coverings. Um, those strategies we know work in limiting the transmission. If you are testing just because you're curious, you know, we just encourage you to continue to honor those, those uh, expectations. If you have reason to think you may have been exposed uh, and, and talk to the, the folks that are supporting you through the testing process or that you may be symptomatic, you know, you're going to be asked to probably to quarantine or isolate depending on your circumstances, but definitely limit your contact with individuals so that uh, until those test results come back. And the reason that we want that back as quickly as possible is so we make sure that you're supported appropriately or um, uh, that you can return to your regular activities uh, with no worry. But again, limit your, your interaction with others um, as much as possible. Thanks, Jake. And obviously, we covered uh, earlier in the call that uh, housing residents will be on a regular testing uh, protocol. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, that's being structured to ensure that um, we're getting great, good coverage across the numerous housing facilities that we have? Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so we've we've engaged a, a lot of experts, both in uh, medicine and public health and epidemiologists and infectious disease folks to help inform our plan. And so we've laid out this requirement or expect requirement, actually, that students in residence halls will get tested every week. But we've we've uh, distributed who gets tested when in such a way that we can identify within residence halls or even floors um, uh, on, a, on a weekly basis if there's a, a prevalence developing there so that we can respond quickly and do do additional focus testing if it's appropriate or or, or additional uh, uh, protocols to mitigate any potential spread. So we feel like that on a weekly basis, we're going to have a very good idea of what's going on within specific residence halls and floors uh, uh, and, and, and the differences between different sites on campus. Thanks, Jake. And uh, just to clarify, uh, what's the frequency on, on testing for housing? I, I thought it was every two weeks. It is. It's every two weeks. Um, but uh, we're distributing the way that occurs so that 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 uh, uh, so we'll have a sense of what's going on on a weekly basis in each residence halls, but individuals will be required to be tested every two weeks. Great. Let me turn uh, to the uh, question that's on, on the top of a lot of people's minds around student behavior. So Lori, can you start um, maybe by just addressing what are the consequences for breaking the Badger Pledge? Yeah, sure. We know this is um, foremost on everybody's minds, including our students, to be honest. We, we had a meeting last night with some student leaders and I've talked to some students all week and they're just they're all worried about each other and they're all wanting to make sure that they follow um, the guidelines and standards. So we're, we're going to look at this from a continuous basis. The provost mentioned that if a student so in the classroom, if a student comes to class and forgets their mask, first of all, we're going to have public health ambassadors. We'll have some student leaders. Um, around the campus that so will be providing some masks. So if they see a student not masked up, they'll be like, hey, did you forget this in your in your rest hall? And and to make sure that um, everybody does it, because I don't know about you, but I, I run to the grocery store and I tend to forget my mask and thankfully have one um, that's in my car that I can grab. So we want to make sure we provide those avenues to students and um, just to give them those reminders, because sometimes it may be that they intend, they just forgot. But we also know that there could be students who are choosing not to follow these guidelines. So from an academic perspective, as the provost mentioned, if students aren't, in the, aren't following guidelines in the classroom, instructors should cancel class, ask students to leave, report that to us, and we will talk to students. And if they're not going to follow those guidelines, they will not be in class. 
They can move to virtual um, learning if that's what they want to do. If they continue to not follow the behaviors outside of the classroom, then they're telling us they don't want to be a part of this community. So again, the, the consequences are going to go up pretty quickly. We're going to try to do our best to educate students, to under, help them understand the seriousness of this. But we, we can't afford for people to take this lightly. We know how important this is to be successful. And so we're trying to educate our students with that. Every message that we're doing, we're talking about the importance of that peer behavior. There's quite a few um, social media things that some creative students and other places are doing about, don't do it, don't do it. You're gonna ruin my educational career. And so whether it's freshmen who may not understand the commitment of what it means to be a Badger and have that strong loyalty like our upperclassmen students, but the risk is higher for them. They don't want to leave. They just got here. They want so badly to start their college career. And so they're worried about the off-campus students. The off-campus students are worried about the freshmen. So the bottom line is we're all in this together. We're going to continue to educate students. We're going to take it very, very seriously. As I mentioned earlier, if off-campus behavior happens, then students can be held accountable in both ways both for their off-campus behavior, which could result in city fines, and the on-campus behavior, which, is, which will impact their ability to be at this institution at this semester. Can't say it more seriously enough. If you want to be here, then students have to follow these rules and follow these guidelines. It is a choice and it is a privilege to be studying at this institution. So these are the requirements. These are the expectations. I believe that the majority of our students will do that. I have confidence in that but we know that there will some be few that'll make some bad choices and we will hold them accountable. Thanks, Lori. Um, Al, let me turn to you on a question about building elevators, which I know has been a, uh, a topic we've, we've delved into a bit. Can you talk about how we're determining building elevator uh, occupancy limits? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, we've got about 450 elevators on campus and they're all different sizes and shapes. Um, so we went out and measured them all. Uh, clearly, you're not gonna be able to have six feet between people in an elevator. And the trade-off here is that we would rather move people quickly up to where they need to go, go, especially when you're in buildings that have eight, 10, 18 floors, uh, so that we avoid having a big clog of people in the elevator lobby. So the trade-off here is what's the right number that people can transition into an elevator cab, move up to their site and get out normally in a minute or two. If everyone's wearing a mask and everyone is spreading out in the elevator, uh, we think that the larger elevators can take five people and move them up and then keep the flow going so they don't get a big crowd in the elevator lobbies. For the smaller elevators, they might be one or two uh, so it's all going to be sized throughout the campus. There'll be a sign at every elevator cab entrance, what the capacity for that elevator is. And that's the trade-off. Uh, thanks. Let me ask uh, another kind of shared space question for you uh, about campus buses. What are the uh, capacity limits going to be on campus buses? I know people are used to seeing um, them very full when we've got bad weather. How are we managing capacity within the campus bus system? Yeah, the campus buses uh, can, I've seen it up to 70 to 80 people on a bus with standing room only, everybody packed in there. Um, the current capacity is going to be 20 when we start next week. And that is consistent with what Dane County is allowing Madison Metro to put on a bus. So that 20 person limit will only change when the city and the Dane County move into a different phase. And we're gonna follow the phases that Madison Metro has to have because we're an integrated service with them. So starting next week, we'll have 20 people on a bus. We have ordered extra buses that we can put 20 or 25 on and everybody be spread out on an individual seat. And we're gonna monitor what the demand is. As I mentioned, we expect there are gonna be fewer people on campus. How many will need to take the bus or feel comfortable with taking the bus, even with a lower density, is something we're going to monitor carefully and we'll adjust the number of buses rather than the capacity to take care of what of the people we need to move around on our campus routes. Great. And uh, before I let you off the hot seat here, let me ask one final facilities question. Um, uh, HVAC systems and air filtration. Can you talk about how we're approaching that within our campus uh, campus buildings? Sure. Once again, uh, 
the layered approach means that we want to evaluate what are the most effective interventions we can do to provide risk mitigation. And as we looked at different alternatives, there have been technology fixes like putting UV light in the, in the HVAC air handlers, uh, putting in bigger filters in those air handlers. And basically what we have found is that when we look at the specifications, we wanna keep air changes going uh, so that there is and maximize the amount of fresh air. If you put a heavy filter on the HVAC systems, you're actually slowing down our ability to move outside air in and circulate it better through the building. And we haven't seen that the UV light applications uh, really make that much of a difference because these large buildings moving large volumes of air, uh, you don't have that much of effect. Uh, so the two biggest things we're doing are the most effective things, but frankly, they're layered on and even a smaller impact compared to wearing a mask, spreading out, washing your hands, observing your symptoms. Those are the real keys to that layered approach. And what we're doing with HVAC is another layer, but it's not nearly as critical as those others. Great, thanks. Um, so let me uh, welcome in Mark Walters, who's our Chief Human Resource Officer, officer for campus. Um, we've gotten a number of employee-focused questions, so let me ask a short set of those here. Uh, Mark, can you address what kind of support and uh, uh, actions we're taking to support supervisors, staff, and faculty, uh, and em any employee who's got a need for a greater flexibility in the fall. Obviously, a number of people are facing unusual child care and schooling circumstances. Uh, and how are we approaching that at campus level? Uh, good morning. Uh, yeah, we're, we're approaching that as uh, providing as much flexibility as we can for, for employees, which really involves discussions on an individual basis to see what, what are the circumstances that the employee is, is dealing with and how can we provide support to, to that employee working through the supervisor, also working with uh, uh, the, the human resource uh, representatives and, and really looking at the unique circumstances and figuring out what, what are the things that can, we can do, whether it be adjusting shifts, um, staggering work hours, uh, looking at job shares, uh, also looking at the various leave options that employees have uh, and all this information is in the Smart Restart resource area. And so it's really taking these individual approaches, uh, trying to provide that flexibility and realizing that we have to balance that flexibility with uh, uh, the, the need to, to um, achieve our mission with research and instruction. Uh, but I, all the activities have been going on, these activities have been going on for the last number of weeks and months to really work with uh, faculty, staff uh, with these issues. Um, and I, I believe it's been largely successful. Uh, thanks. And so I know there's been a lot of questions uh, about students and classroom environments, maybe not not wearing masks. Can I ask the same for an employee side, which is if you've got a coworker who is not reliably wearing their mask or not wearing their mask at all, how should you uh, approach that as an employee? panelists uh, responsibilities as a community to to keep 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 all uh, the uh, each other safe uh, within our campus environment and so if that circumstance uh, does occur that the the employee should uh, remind their co-workers that uh, they should be following the public health protocols and and uh, indicate that uh, we're all in this together to keep to keep each other safe and if that if that doesn't work then having a discussion with your supervisor to let them know that uh, that there are um, colleagues that are not following the, the public health protocols, such as wearing a, a mask. I would say that you, you do not want to get into any uh, altercations or, 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 or things of that nature where you're um, confronting employees. That you want to really work with the, your supervisor and others, and then we'll determine how that needs to be escalated. Uh, a variety of ways to to address that. Uh, if you're an employee that's dealing with a customer um, that's coming from outside the campus community, uh, if they're not uh, um, uh, wearing a, a face covering, uh, asking them to leave, uh, those types of situations. Uh, but we really have uh, protocols of, of dealing with the, 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 those circumstances. And 
and uh, employees should uh, uh, be elevating those issues as needed. Thanks. Um, a really specific benefits question as well. Um, uh, an emailer asks, is there any additional flexibility coming for those of us who have medical FSAs beyond the 10% uh, increase in carryover capacity um, or the, the expiring opportunity to alter the tax deferred payments to the FSA for the remainder of the year? Well, I'll say, Matt, that those, those, those provisions were put in place because of, of the pandemic and that uh, uh, this particular area is, is controlled by the Wisconsin Employee Trust Funds uh, along with federal requirements. We're always looking for more flexibilities that we can, uh, that we can get uh, with our benefits area, but uh, frankly, a, a number of these things are out, outside of our control. Uh, we've been pushing to increase flexibilities. You, you mentioned some of the, uh, the things that have been put, put in place. Um, so we're actively working on ways that we can um, create more of those flexibilities, uh, but um, the, uh, there isn't anything as of late uh, that has expanded the, the, those areas, uh, but we continue to push. Uh, thanks, Mo. Um, can Maybe this next one is for Carl or Jake. Um, what are the guidelines that we're providing to instructors for accommodating sick or quarantined students? Uh, and and then secondly, are students going to be required to show documentation of their uh, illness uh, uh, to their instructors in order to access those accommodations? So I'm going to start on this and then let uh, Jake uh, correct whatever I say that's incorrect. Uh, so the starting point of it is that we have uh, been absolutely clear to instructors, departments, and schools and colleges that we want to do everything we can to accommodate the learning of a student who either is sick or needs to be quarantined because of close contact with a infected, uh, another infected person in the community. And so uh, um, we're asking instructors to provide necessary materials for the students to continue their progress. If possible, make a uh, uh, capture of a, a lectures available to the students to do what they can to support the learning of the students. As, as the question, will students be required to show documentation to instructors? I do not believe so. I, we're asking instructors and of course our students to truthfully report um, uh, if, if they need to be uh, misclassed for a significant period of time, whether for the flu or mono or from COVID-19 or other, other things. And so I don't think we're getting to the point where we're having to show verified documentation. Just as in March, when we, uh, a lot of faculty members, myself included, would often say for a student, eh, you know, to miss an exam or something like that, I need to see a doctor's note. And we, we strongly, discouraged, prohibited that kind of requirement because we didn't want to overburden the health system. Same way here. We don't want students who have to be quarantined then to go again to a medical provider and say, hey, would you sign this note that I can show my instructor? And so we're going to we're going to take things at face value. And I think that's the right thing to do. Jake, anything to add on that? No, I, I think I think that the relationship of trust between the instructor, the faculty member, and the student is really important. The student does need to be able to control what information they share about their personal health condition. Um, they will be given really clear instructions about what they need to do, and we just we we expect, as I think usually occurs, that students and faculty work together to to navigate that. But uh, we shouldn't set up the we should not set up the expectation that there be a requirement for that. Um, we're nearing the end of time here, but let me try to bucket up a couple general themes. And Jake, I'll stick with you here on this one. Uh, you know, a number of people are noting concern about the community impacts of students returning uh, I, into Dane County, where we've, we've had a really strong public health position over the past month or so. Can you talk a little bit about how we are partnering with uh, public health Dane County, both on the contact tracing front and also on planning matters? 
Yeah, th thank you, Matt. And and that's clearly an important uh, collaboration that occurs between the, the campus and the community. What happens on the campus or in the community affects the other. So we, we are definitely syncing up and, and we're in regular, if not daily contact um, uh, with with the staff and the experts in, in both spaces to support the work that we're doing. The, the contact tracing work is literally an extension of that that's done through the public health department. Uh, we're working within their protocols to, to support the success of that. We know that we want to be able to support the campus's impact on, on that work, which is the reason that we've invested so significantly in our own team to support the contact tracing uh, here on the campus or where it intersects with the campus. And so we, we take that as, a, as an important part of it, uh, a responsibility and our partnership there. And obviously we're, we're coordinating and understanding how testing availability changes within the community and the campus to make sure that the that, that, that the students and faculty and staff that are here at UW can continue to get that support that they need around testing. Great. Um, Lauren, I don't want to leave you without uh, a question directed towards you. So let me uh, let me ask, uh, I think people have seen from other, other schools this acute need for isolation and quarantine space. Can you go a little deeper on our capacity just to provide those needed spaces? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, obviously, um, we're lucky here at UW-Madison um, to have a fantastic team in housing and dining uh, who've been thinking about this problem really hard uh, with a lot of help from uh, Jake and the UH UHS folks. Uh, but we're also lucky that we have some really great conferencing facilities and uh, hotel facilities. Uh, so Lowell Hall, um, uh, uh, the Fluno Center, et cetera, here on campus. Uh, and we pressed all those different facilities into service as possible uh, locations um, where quarantine and isolation could take place uh, for those who might need it. Uh, you know, we already have folks living in housing and dining uh, and uh, making use of our facilities and testing is already happening. So this is all stood up and ready to go uh, should we need it. Um, and uh, the chancellor mentioned we do have some contracts in the local community that allow us to overflow if we need to. Uh, so we feel like we're really robustly prepared there and that that will not be a contributing factor uh, uh, to problems for us here at Madison. Great, thanks, Loren. Uh, we're just a few minutes now and I, I, I wanna give the chancellor an opportunity after one final question to provide any closing remarks to the group here. Uh, but chancellor, let me kind of return to one of the, uh, an element of a question that we asked earlier, which is, um, how are we assembling information and uh, looking at peers and uh, pulling together different research and advice as we're making our plans for the fall? Uh, what are we learning from others and, and how are we thinking about the thresholds by which we'll look at changes in operations? Well, you know, yes to all of the above in terms of what information we've been trying to put together. Um, we've obviously been keeping up with the research literature on this. We've been talking closely with um, a good number of the medical experts here on campus, and we are fortunate to have some wonderful experts in infectious diseases who've just been great partners, whether it was putting together testing or figuring out health protocols. Um, you know, we... Um, obviously are looking, you know, consulting regularly with, you know, through the provost, through Loren, through myself, with what our peers are doing and any creative idea that one of them came up with, we immediately would grab and, and try to see how that would make sense on our campus. Um, you know, so it's it's been, it's been a real team effort pulling together as much information from enough different places um, as we possibly can, including doing some of our own experiments. As you all know, um, the engineering design school has, um, you know, put together these badger shields, which we're gonna be using in a lot of classrooms. Our facilities people actually did some experiments looking at um, what if you tried to use UVA um, in, you know, as, the, as your airflow came through, it turned out it actually constrained airflow rather than improved it. Um, you know, so, you know, we've, we've really been quite serious about this. Um, and, you know, as we go forward, um, we are going to continue to, you know, look at the daily evidence, which we will have off of testing and other um, other pieces of information um, to say, you know, what's happening on campus and how should we best respond. Um, 
let me uh, just close by saying again, thank you to everyone. It has been such a strange time. And um, I know that uh, a lot of our staff and faculty and students have just been under a lot of pressure, pressure from home, pressure from all the changes in jobs, just the uncertainty of trying to figure out what's going to happen next is not easy to live with. And, um, you know, Laurie, I think, said it best when she said, look, we're all in this together for the fall. Um, we all have to follow the right protocols. Um, we all have to treat the community and the community's well-being seriously. It's never mattered more that we we think about not just the impact on ourselves, but the impact on the others around us of our own behavior and our own behavior, not just on the job or on campus or in class, but on the weekends and in the evenings as well. And, um, you know, I have a great deal of faith in the Badger community. Um, it is a group that has been very generative and very giving and um, very concerned with each other in a number of ways in past years. And we need all of that in this year to come. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. Great. Thank you so much, Chancellor Blank. And thanks for everyone who's able to join us today. Uh, this will conclude the Smart Restart update for our broad campus community. Um, but I want to remind people to keep a watch on the Smart Restart website for additional information as it becomes available and remind people that if there are additional questions, you can continue to submit them through the same email address. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great Friday.